Hello, I'm Kyle Warmack with the West Virginia Humanities Council. Welcome to History Alive. History Alive is a program of the Humanities Council that brings historical figures to life through first-person portrayals by presenters who have conducted thorough research into their character. The Humanities Council makes these characters available to both nonprofit and for-profit organizations across West Virginia. History Alive is designed as an interactive experience between the character and the audience. They are entertaining and educational. We encourage your organization, school, or event to host a presentation and bring a figure from history for a visit with your audience or students. Having someone like Harriet Tubman or Stonewall Jackson come to speak to your group can breathe life into these historical figures. Nothing compares to the live, in-person visit. Each presentation consists of three parts, a monologue, a question and answer session with the character, and then the presenter breaks character to answer questions about how he or she conducted their research. Our History Alive presenters have researched a variety of sources, such as diaries, journals, letters, official documents, autobiographies, and the research of other scholars in developing their character. A History Alive presentation is not a play. It is an audience participation event that relies on interaction between the audience and the character. Being able to ask your own questions of these important figures from the past is a unique experience. It's difficult to reproduce the feel of an actual History Alive presentation here in the studio. Without an audience to ask questions, we will change the format a bit and have our guests sit with me for a few questions after the monologue. But we hope to give a sample of how a History Alive presentation can add to your program offerings. There will be information on the screen at the end of this program for how to contact the Humanities Council about bringing a History Alive character to your community. At this time, I would like to welcome today's guest from history. We are pleased to have with us in the studio, Francis Pierpont. Good day to you all and welcome. My name is Francis Pierpont, formerly the governor of the Restore Government of Virginia. Thank you for joining me here today. I am often called upon to recount my experiences during the late war between the states uh, of the formation of the restored government of Virginia and of course uh, on the creation of our new state of West Virginia. And I'm always pleased to speak on these matters for they are discussions that are worthy of examination and remembrance. It has been my experience and is my belief that providence places us in the positions we need to be in when we need to be in them. For us, how could you explain the son of a tanner from Fairmont, Virginia, becoming the governor of the great state of the Commonwealth of Virginia? Now, I did have the advantage of a good education. I matriculated to Allegheny College in Pennsylvania and afterwards became a teacher, but that not being to my taste, I studied the law, but it was my experience in teaching that took me to the state of Mississippi. And there for the first time, I was witness to the horrors of plantation slavery, which was something that I never forgot. And when I came back to Virginia, I began to study the law. I took the bar examination and became an attorney. Now it was this involvement in the issues of the day that got me to write and speak on political matters. I should not think that I would be, be considered a politician at that time. Certainly, I have never run for any political office, never campaigned for anything, uh, but I was an outspoken advocate for the union cause as tensions grew between the northern and the southern states. Now, you all recall how the matter began in December of 1860 when South Carolina seceded and several of the other southern states followed her lead. But you also recall that Virginia was not among them. Virginia knew as a border state she would suffer greatly. And so there needed to be more discussion and deliberation on the matter. So it was the spring of 1861 when the legislators met in the capital city of Richmond to discuss the idea and the, 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 the issue of secession. And you know that they took a few votes and in those votes, they voted against seceding from the United States. They voted to remain a part of the United States. But of course, after the incidents of April, when Fort Sumter was fired upon and President Lincoln called for 
troops to quell the Southern Rebellion, well, that last vote in the legislature in Virginia of April 17th, the majority of Virginia delegates voted to secede from the United States, indeed to go to war with the United States of America. Many of our Western delegates in Virginia did not vote for secession. They voted against, and they came back to this side of the mountains to discuss what would be our next move as Western Virginians. And there were mass meetings in places like Morgantown and Fairmont and Kingwood. And in those mass meetings, it was decided a more formal convention needed to be held to discuss these matters. And that Wheeling would be the most appropriate place to have those discussions. Indeed, well positioned between the powerful states of Pennsylvania and Ohio, the delegates could meet there in safety to discuss the issues of secession. Now in that first Wheeling convention of May of 1861, many delegates came from many counties. Some of them, like John Carlisle from Harrison County, showed up with a delegation demanding immediate separation west from east in Virginia. They called for a new state. New Virginia, now or never, was the mantra of Mr. Carlisle's delegation. But in that first Wheeling Convention, things were confusing. Nobody knew who spoke for whom and who was the legitimate representatives from their counties. And so we disbanded from that first Wheeling Convention, not determining anything other than we needed to have a second convention with a more formal process. And it was during this time after the first Wheeling Convention, I was at my home in Fairmont. I was in my study. I was reading from the Constitution. And there I came across Article 4, Section 4. And now my wife, Julia, she was below stairs at the time, and she could hear me yell out, Eureka, I found it. For Article 4, Section 4 lays out the process by which a new state could be formed from a parent state. And in this discussion we had in Wheeling about the formation of a new state, about acting on generation-old grievances between East and West, and finally creating a new state of our own, I found the plan. I found the way that it could be done. And so when we came to Wheeling for that second Wheeling Convention in June of 1861, I took this plan with me, and I found eager ears among my fellow delegates to the Wheeling Convention. And so we move forward with a plan, and it was this. In our manner of thinking, those in Virginia who had joined the Confederacy had vacated their positions. We saw fit to fill those positions and to restore that government for Virginia. And indeed, we called ourselves the restored government of Virginia. And one of the very first things we did is that we drafted the Declaration of Rights of the people of Virginia. And in that, we laid out our argument. We stated that those office holders had illegally left their positions and we had reconstituted and filled those positions and restored the government of Virginia. Now, for a new state to be created from the parent state, as I read in the Constitution, the legislature of the parent state must give its permission. And so we reconstituted and restored the government of Virginia. And then we began the process for that government to give its permission to once and finally have a new state in the West. Now, these were unprecedented circumstances. There were no foregone conclusions in this matter. And I have to tell you that it was with some trepidation that when my fellow delegates began to approach me to consider being the governor of this new restored government of Virginia, I had to give it some thought. But as I said, Providence places us in the position where we need to be, when we need to be in it. And therefore I saw it as my duty to serve in this position. And so I was humbled and I was honored that the majority, in fact, unanimously, the delegates to the Second Wheeling Convention elected me to be the governor of the restored government of Virginia. And I was sworn into office June 20th of 1861. I wrote to my wife, Julia, and I told her that 
Providence only knows what the outcome will be, that I had some consternation about taking on this role. We had no money to fund this government. We had no precedent to go by. We had no way to gauge how the people of Western Virginia would react. But we move forward. Now, one of the first things I had to do was to see to the raising of troops, the commissioning of officers. For in 1861, there was a great deal of action on this side of the mountains in Western Virginia. Things were running amok, out of control. So we had to get those under control. We had to raise our troops and commission our officers, and we had to fund this government. And so I began to write to President Lincoln, and I found that he became a good friend. He began to be desirous of the, the, uh, this, this new restored government of Virginia uh, taking effect and getting things under control in Western Virginia. And indeed, he provided us military and financial aid. Now, we had to put forth the idea of the new state for the people of Western Virginia to vote upon it. In October of 1861, we put that out for a vote. And I am pleased that the majority of Western Virginians voted overwhelmingly to create this new state, some 18,000. Another 700 voted against. So you can see that overwhelmingly people were in favor of the new state of Kanawha, as it were to be called. So the people had spoken, and I saw fit to move forward and bring this new statehood movement into play. And the first thing that we needed was a constitution for this new state. And so we met in November of 1861 in our first constitutional convention at the old custom house in Wheeling. Now, the very first day, the very first issue brought by the gentleman to the floor was the name of this new state. Some felt that Kanawha was an inappropriate name. And so for three days, we vigorously debated about the name of the state. And some wanted nothing with Virginia in the name. And they proposed Kanawha, Kanawha Allegheny, Augusta, Vandalia, Others felt that we should not have to give up the name, for we had as much right to the name as the Virginians did. This was our heritage. This was our legacy. We were part of that. And therefore, they proposed New Virginia, Western Virginia, West Virginia. Ultimately, as you know, we settled on West Virginia. Now, there were still many things to be done. We had to send our Constitution to the United States Congress for their approval. And when we did, they rejected it because they said we had not included anything in our Constitution for the new state regarding the manumission of slaves. And so it was Mr. Willie, Senator Willie, one of our senators, along with Senator Carlisle from Harrison County to the Congress. Senator Willie came up with an amendment which called for a gradual emancipation. Now that was palatable enough for the Congress and for President Lincoln so that they did approve our state constitution. Now, things were still not, there were, again, there were no foregone conclusions in this unprecedented experiment, this fearful experiment. Now, during that time, I was in Wheeling and had my office in the United States Custom House. And I could not often go home to Fairmont my wife, Julia, would write to me and say, Frank, you and some of the other men should stay in Wheeling. There are many secessionists here that wish you ill. Now, Governor Letcher of Virginia, he put out a call for our capture, in particular, the governor, the ex-governor of Virginia, wanted me fairly bad. He called me that little boy, that little boy playing governor up in Wheeling. And so, Everywhere I went for several years, I had a constant bodyguard with me. I had those with me who were charged with my protection. And there were incidents in which there were plans to capture me, but thankfully they were found out and they were thwarted. My family had to be moved. It was no longer safe, particularly after 
Jones and Emboden launched their secessionist raid into Western Virginia in 1863. So I had to move my family to Pennsylvania to be in safety. I did not often see them, and that was very difficult. Made particularly difficult after the passing of my young daughter. So I, like President Lincoln, in the midst of all this turmoil and tumult, was also dealing with the loss of a child. But there were many duties to attend to, and they kept my mind very busy. Perhaps that was beneficial. But again, I feared not for my safety. I felt that providence would protect me. So back to our story. Now, President Lincoln, he had the statehood bill on his desk. And I can tell you at that time that he was not pleased to have to consider the statehood bill. He had many other things on his mind, but there were many who implored him, including myself, sent many a telegram to President Lincoln, urging him to pass the West Virginia statehood bill. I told him of the consequence of not doing so, of the effect that it would have, not only on the troops from our state, but on the, pe on the people in general, that it would be a devastating blow to their morale were it not to come to fruition. Now, as I understand, he took this to his cabinet, and of the six members, three voted for and three voted against the idea of this new state. Again, these are unprecedented circumstances. This has never been done before. So it was President Lincoln who was the deciding factor on creating our state. And on December 31st, he approved the statehood bill. Now it was April of the next year of 1863 when he issued the statehood proclamation, which were to take effect 60 days later on June 20th of 1863. And on that grand and glorious day, when our new state came into being, what a celebration there was in Wheeling. Bells rung across town. 35 young women sang the Star Spangled Banner. There was a 35 gun salute for our new 35th state. Now I had been asked about my intentions. Would I become, should I become, the governor of the new state of West Virginia. But I chose to remain as the governor of the restored government of Virginia, for I felt it was my duty to steer Virginia through this calamity. And indeed, what would happen if the governor of the government, which had just created the new state, were to leave? What if that government were to dissipate? What would that mean about West Virginia state? Because even so, we still had years of civil war ahead of us, a few. We did not know what the conclusion would be. And therefore we did not know if this newly created state would yet stand. What would be the future of this new experiment? And so, on June the 20th of 1863, it was the esteemed and honorable Arthur Borman of Parkersburg who became the first governor of our new state of West Virginia. I took my administration across to Virginia, to Alexandria, for it was my intention to see through to the end of the war, this restored government of Virginia. And there I administered Virginia's government for the next few years, it was an interesting time. I had to be very careful in my movements and my associations. There were those there who wished me harm, but we persevered and we stood strong and we did well by Virginia. I always tried to be fair. I always tried to be equitable. And therefore I have to believe that that is one of the reasons why at the conclusion of the conflict, President Lincoln saw fit to install me in Richmond to continue to govern Virginia. Now, Virginia was different than many of the Southern states in that I was allowed a civil administration while other Southern states were under a military administration. And I tried to be fair. I tried to embrace 
President Lincoln's philosophy of reconciliation and to bring our people together because we were very divided. The animosity still lingered. The hurt, the pain, the loss still ever present. And for three years, I governed in Richmond. And I'm thankful that Providence placed me there and that I had the opportunity to create the new state to steer Virginia through a civil war. As we mentioned at the top of the show, it's difficult to replicate the unique experience of a History Alive question and answer session without a live audience. But I'm lucky enough to fill that role today. Please join me in welcoming our guest, Francis Pierpont. Thank you for being here, Mr. Pierpont. Thank you for having me, sir. You said earlier uh, that you never campaigned for political office. So uh, was there any sort of uh, preparation? Um, was, there, was there any sort of groundwork for becoming the governor of the restored government of Virginia? Well, I suppose my education prepared me for that, my reading of the law as well. And while I had never campaigned or sought to be in a political office, I did write quite often and speak quite often on political matters, particularly as things became heated in the late years right before the war between the states. And so uh, more than anything, I believe it was the fact that I brought the plan for the formation of the state to the Second Wheeling Convention and that uh, I had the respect of many of the legislators there that, uh, and quite frankly, uh, perhaps none of them uh, wanted the job. Uh, and so they saw fit to unanimously, unanimously elect me to, to that position. And, uh, and I was humbled and honored about that. But uh, I think that, that perhaps my involvement in writing and discussing political matters and the plan for the state put me in that position. I see. Did you receive any death threats while you were in office? You know, there were, there were incidents of concern. Uh, there were times when I could not come home to Fairmont because of secessionist activities, and, and indeed when Jones and Bowden made their raid in 1863, uh, I had just left Fairmont, and they saw fit to, to burn my library. My beloved books were, were taken out to the front yard and, and burned, but uh, books can be replaced. Um, there were attempts, uh, there was a plan to intercept me on a train at one time, uh, and then in Richmond, uh, I, I got a pleasant note from a, a Colonel Mosby, the great ghost of the Confederacy, he was called. But Colonel Mosby, he, he wrote me a lovely letter in which he stated, uh, Governor Pierpont, did you see me by your window earlier today? Because I saw you and I can get you easy. Um, but I must say that I had a great deal of protection during my time as the governor of the restored government. And uh, although there were... Uh, many threats or perceived threats, uh, there were men who were fighting and dying on the fields of battle. So uh, it is, uh, I was not as concerned about my safety. Mm -hmm. What do you think is your most notable achievement as the head of the restored government of Virginia? Goodness, sir. I must say that I was proud that I was able to steer Virginia through the conflict. Uh, it was my duty to make sure the Commonwealth held firm for the Union and that our Unionist restored government uh, did well and persevered. Uh, so I'm very proud of that. But obviously, sir, I must tell you that, uh, that the creation of our new state and my role in it is perhaps my, my proudest achievement. It had been discussed for generations and we had the opportunity to make it happen, uh, and we did. You mentioned some correspondence with President Lincoln um, mm -hmm. while the formation of the state was taking place. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get to meet him in person? Was there more interaction with him? I did not. I did not meet him in person. Uh, it was only through our telegrams. But we established, uh, I felt that we established a rapport. Um, and of, obviously I sent representatives uh, to speak with him in Washington, uh, like Jacob Beeson Blair and others. Uh, but we carried on a, a pretty vigorous uh, correspondence with our telegrams. What an incredible invention to send and receive messages almost instantly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Pierpont, and welcome to the show, Travis. Hey. <laughs> 
So Travis, you're a, um, a Bridgeport, West Virginia native. Yes. Um, how did you become interested in the life of Francis Pierpont? Well, I was the site manager of West Virginia Independence Hall in downtown Wheeling, which is the former United States Custom House, which became the scene for the Wheeling Conventions, uh, for the, uh, the drafting of the Declaration of Rights of the people of Virginia, of our state constitution, all those things occurred there. And, and so we consider that the birthplace of West Virginia, and rightfully so the most important, probably the most important building in the state. And it was during my time there, of course, Pierpont had his office there, that I, I became very involved with his story and became very aware of him. And the more I became involved with his story and learned more about him, the more surprised I became that most West Virginians, most West Virginians, even those who, who, who proudly, uh, you know, know, you know, are proud of their history and, and proud of, of their state, they don't know about this guy. They don't really realize uh, his role and, and what he did and, and, and you know, the, the, the perseverance, the courage it took for him to do the things he did. And so I'm always, I'm always uh, taken aback that more people don't know about Francis Pierpont in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. Wow. So while you were getting to know him, what were some of the most important sources for gaining insights into his life and character? Sure, there's a great biography by Charles Ambler which was written in the early 20th century that, uh, I mean, to this, to this date, it is the definitive biography of Pierpont. Uh, that's a great information source. Recently, a descendant of his, Krista Pierpont, which I have, you know, we've met a few times. I'm, I'm still connected and in contact with the Pierpont family descendants. Um, she published, uh, the title is In His Own Words. It's more an autobiography of Pierpont writing about his experiences, and she published that. But uh, importantly, the Francis Pierpont Papers, which are in the West Virginia and Regional History Collection at, at WVU, uh, invaluable because they are, um, you know, it's a copious record of his telegrams. And so that gave me a great, great insight on his day-to-day -day life as a wartime governor in Virginia. Things like raising troops, supplying troops, trying to fund this government, dealing with squabbles between officers, uh, how he's going to deal with Confederate prisoners and their disposition. I mean, I've often said, I don't know how this man uh, slept sometimes. I mean, he had so much on his plate, uh, it's amazing that he accomplished all that he did. Mm -hmm. But those are the main sources that wow. I, would, I would turn to. Yeah. Um, very briefly, do you have a favorite telegram that, that comes to mind? A favorite telegram? Well, I mean, the, probably the more important one uh, is the one he sent to Lincoln on the eve of his, uh, his statehood decision. And in that telegram, <clears throat> he, he implores him to pass the statehood bill, and he tells them that, uh, that it would be demoralizing to the people and to the troops if he did not do so. It's one of the more important ones ever sent. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Travis. If your organization is interested in hosting a History Alive presentation, call the number on your screen or visit www.wvhumanities.org for more information. Thank you.